the presenters for today are myself, uh, Jeff Kopp, Maureen Stewart, and Kate Beatty. We are all partners in our labor and employment practice group, and we all hail from different offices throughout the country, Boston, Detroit, Tampa, Madison. Um, and so with that, I think we'll get started. Our agenda today is a brief overview and initial to-dos, uh, what to do when a crisis arises and what types of crises we will talk about. As you can see from the agenda screen, we're gonna hit malicious insider, vendor wrongdoing, and OSHA incident or accident, uh, labor disputes, including and in particular addressing strike issues. And then we'll touch briefly on political, religious, or civil rights issues. Uh, questions, we're gonna try and save a little bit of time at the end, but if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the uh, chat box or there is a question box that I believe um, Liz will be able to monitor for us as we're proceeding along. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the overview. All manner of possible occurrences that can create a workplace crisis are not covered by this short list, but this is the most popular or common list of incidences or occurrences that will generally arise in a workplace that we are going to discuss today. So incidents and accidents, regula regulatory agency visits, whether it be the EPA, uh, DOR, OSHA, DOL, any of the alphabet soup agencies, external and internal complaints and reports, we're gonna hit the approaches for uh, addressing a crisis. And again, that approach is gonna be a little bit dependent upon the type of crisis that is occurring, right? It's gonna be a little bit different if OSHA knocks on your door uh, versus if the EPA knocks on your door versus a strike. Approaches may also depend on the type of company for which you work, whether that be a publicly traded uh, corporation or whether that be a public company. So initially, common initial considerations, i.e. Uh, primarily the do's and don'ts that are uh, universal to all forms of crises. Uh, first, do not panic, right? Nothing good comes from running around like a chicken with your head cut off. If you need to address a crisis, the first thing you always need to do is take a breath, slow the process down, think of the situation and triage the needs and concerns. The second thing we recommend you do is identify the audience and the stakeholders that are going to be implicated by the crisis. Who is it that we're speaking to or on the benefit or behalf of? Third, Identify what the goal is. What is the response or the outcome most desired from what we're dealing with or what we're addressing? Primarily, we want a clean report or a closed investigation. That could be one goal. Uh, the second goal might be a public relations control, an opportunity to tell our side of the story. A third goal might be taking care of our own workers, our own employees. Uh, generally, the most important asset of any company is their own employees. The company can't move forward without that asset being uh, in a good place, right? That might means emotionally and from a morale standpoint. Some additional do's and don'ts. After you've identified the you know, the target audience and our goals, you have to start to assemble your response team. Uh, the, that will greatly depend on the type of crisis involved, right? Like with OSHA, your response team should obviously involve the uh, health and safety director or somebody of that nature. Uh, with strikes, maybe you need somebody from your labor relations group or department. Uh, with a catastrophe, you are going to want a number of persons on that response team, including somebody from a PR standpoint who can help you craft a public relations statement and address things of that nature. 
always consider privilege and any other confidentiality concerns. I will recommend that the response team will more than likely involve an attorney, whether that be in-house counsel or outside counsel, so that at least initially you can establish privilege so that the information that is shared can be shared in an open manner and yet still pre preserved from public dissemination. It's recommended that you draft some kind of an action plan. That action plan should be drafted with the end goals in mind. So you're always thinking about the results, what you're hoping for, and then drafting the plan to be consistent with getting to that end result. You have to consider notification requirements, if any, and to whom, for example, maybe insurance providers, Maybe we have an EPA release that requires notification to the Environmental Protection Agency or your state equivalent of the same. If we're a public company, maybe we need to put on notice our board of directors, even if we're a private company, but the issue involves a C-suite individual. We might want our board of directors knowledgeable about what's happening and what's going on. Finally, always common, remember document preservation and concerns. More often than not, a failure to preserve evidence, including documentation, can be far worse than the incident or accident that is the instigus for the crisis management situation. So bear that in mind. Document holds are a very good idea at an early stage so we can ensure that everything is preserved. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker. And I believe Maureen is gonna address the malicious insider crisis. You may be on mute if you're speaking. I was, I'm sorry, I, I followed the no directions forgot to unmute. Um, so hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan. Um, I was saying on mute that I sort of have the kind of grab bag of the crises that we're going to talk about today, which um, is the malicious insider. It covers a range of different potential crises that come and they're all slightly different. So um, although they, they involve, right, a malicious insider, but the, the array of types of um, potential malicious wrongdoing that could come up within a company are different. And some examples include um, what I think if you were to say malicious insider, people would um, immediately go to, which is the fraud and the embezzlement, right? On the employee's behalf, they are um, committing a wrong on the company for their own benefit. But it, those that that's one example, right? Fraud, embezzlement. Others include um, IP theft. We have seen that um, th that can range. IP theft um, could be for the person's benefit. I have been involved in crises where the internal employee was actually stealing on behalf of, of a foreign entity, um, and that ra ra raises all other types of concerns. Other types include um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, people often think of that as a company crisis and not necessarily a malicious insider. Um, but what's important to remember with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is most companies who um, work in other jurisdictions do have compliance programs, have policies and practices in place. And so the employee is actually a malicious insider. And this is one of the things that um, is often difficult to um, when you have a client who calls you with a crisis to get the client to understand is they are a victim too. The company can be a victim um, in, in these types of scenarios because the employee is going against their policies and procedures. So part of what is critical, and as I, I'll go through the different steps that Dan outlined, is critical to remember in your action plan is building that record that the company had policies and practices in place um, that the malicious insider thwarted. Um, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't room for improvement, but part of it is documenting those policies and procedures and the way in which they thwarted the controls in place, because that could be important if you have notification requirements. 
Um, there's also can be regulatory wrongdoing and then the concealment of it. Sometimes you have an employee who maybe makes a mistake or does something wrong and then or learns that they um, that their work uh, resulted in um, a safety problem for the product. Um, and instead of doing the right thing and, and notifying and raising the issue up, what they do is conceal, right? So the initial, um, the real wrong there is the concealment and the prevention of the company from being able to um, fix, the, fix the actual issue. And that, you know, again, this is where um, people don't often think about the company can be the victim too and the concealment of the problem and not raising it through the proper channels prevented the company from taking action that creates real risk for the company. And then in, in recent years and really following the Me Too movement, which has been um, a, a good rec recognition of this issue is really that C-suite, that executive level pervasive type um, harassment and discrimination, sexual harassment, different types of discrimination and, and those um, again, that is a C-level executive that is violating, I'm sure, company policy. And so making sure to identify these as malicious insider, but that crisis when it comes in helps you put the plans and necessary plans in place um, as you're responding to it. So hey, Maureen, one, before, yeah. before you go on, it sounds like the, the first thing that you are making sure that clients or others in companies have is either some kind of policy to raise issues and concerns so the company is not a victim. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Um, yes. It, critical to, um, you know, critical on the advice side before a crisis is raised where we step in is help companies have robust compliance programs and whistleblowing avenues, multiple avenues um, for uh, uh, people to report wrongdoing internally of, of their colleagues, of their supervisors. And the critical thing that we often talk about is the multiple avenues um, of reporting. And then the key thing that often actually we find is missed in these, a lot of companies will have multiple avenues. They'll have the, the anonymous reporting hotline. They'll have the open door policy. They'll have the, you don't have to go to your supervisor. You can go, but, but they don't message it and they haven't, you know, you'll talk to employees and they'll say, oh, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know there was. So um, the critical, you know, the, the preventing or hopefully pre preventing this or becoming aware of it is um, having those reporting channels in place, but not only having them in place, making sure your employees know how to use them, where they are, and um, having a culture of, hey, if you see something, say something. Um, and that can help prevent it from um, really spiraling to a crisis, right? You can have an employee that you catch very early doing something wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't come to our level, right? It doesn't lead to the call to outside counsel of, oh no, we just learned that this person has been in this role for 10 years and has for 10 years have been committing fraud and embezzlement. And I can't tell you, I have had a lot of calls along those lines. And if you end up talking to employees in those scenarios, you learn, well, everyone had this feeling, but no one really knew how to raise it or where to raise it, or it just didn't seem right. But, and oftentimes the companies had the right policies, the right procedures in place, but, but maybe the messaging wasn't there. Um, so that's a great, that's a great thing um, that we have seen and w always a way to improve. Um, so one of the things that, that comes up is you get a report of wrongdoing. Sometimes it's already public. The information is already public. And so a covert operation is not possible, um, which will then change your action plan. If people already know about it and it's already public information, your action plan is going to be a lot different than if it is covert. So I'm going to talk a little bit first about the covert action plan and when um, the steps that you want to take when something comes quietly, it's not public, it's not well known. Um, and Dan hit on it at the very first thing, it's do not panic, put it in red, slow down. Um, and why? Well, oftentimes in that the initial steps of a crisis, you can't undo your first steps. 
You can't undo it if you make it public. You can't undo if, um, for example, you call the authorities. You find out a, a high level executive is stealing from the business and people's initial thought is sometimes to call the police. And, and we've had that happen before. You can't undo that. And um, so, and that might not actually be the right step for the business. Um, and part of that could be, you don't know who the co-conspirators are. You don't know who you can trust. And the minute it becomes public, that's when destruction of evidence happens. That's when um, your inability to implement a plan can um, be hindered by taking public act actions. So I can't overemphasize that first do not panic, slow down um, response to a crisis. It doesn't mean don't act with urgency. It doesn't mean don't make that initial call to outside counsel or to in-house counsel, uh, depending your role. That needs to happen urgently and quickly. But from there, you do not have to take immediate irreversible steps within the first 24 hours of a crisis. Um, so often you'll think about, you've learned someone's stealing. Well, you immediately think walk them out the door. That actually could be very disruptive for the business and um, it's, so, it's why it's so important to identify what your goal is. Of course, part of the goal will be getting out the malicious insider and, and making sure they are extracted from your organization. But it might not be within a week. It might take longer than that, depending on what harm they're currently causing to the organization. So critical in identifying when a crisis comes who the potential co-conspirators could be or who could be the people with knowledge of it happening. It might be only the person internal, but it could be others. And so slowing that down to, to determine that is very important. And that's a, that will be a priority. Um, and then also identifying that very small but critical group of stakeholders and, um, and uh, basically the managers of the investigation. And, and the action plan. Who's gonna implement the action plan and who's gonna be in the know? Um, and it's gonna be a regular scheduled, um, a regular scheduled meeting and call that you will have with the same group of people that you can trust and confidence to make sure that you have a, an action plan that can be implemented. Um, critically important is whatever the action plan is, it derives, as, as Dan said, from your goal but it also is nimble and can change because things change as you learn more information. You might think um, that in the person to replace this C-level executive is, um, is um, person A, but as you go through and learn more in response to this, you learn that person A isn't the right person, maybe because the person was a co-conspirator or more likely maybe because they don't have the trust of the team in order to implement the succession plan successfully. Um, one of the, the things that people often um, forget when they're in crisis mode is um, different things that may change your action plan and may change your goals. One of them being notification requirements and regulatory requirements. You do not have an obligation to turn yourself in for a crime. You don't even have the obligation to turn in an employee for a crime that they committed against the organization with certain exceptions. There are exceptions because, for example, if you learn of employee wrongdoing where the employee is a, um, an attorney, there are mandatory bar obligations in terms of reporting to the bar. Um, there might be um, obligations because you're a government contractor. There might be obligation reporting obligations because of uh, government submissions that were made that maybe had um, false information on them and you have to correct them. So identifying the potential for public notifications that may come down the line will be critically important to your action plan and how you identify your next steps because if public notification is inevitable, the um, need to keep the information from becoming public or from becoming public now is not a goal. Sometimes that is a goal, 
um, that you don't want the information to become public. And so that will be a critical aspect of your action plan. But if you aren't thinking 10 steps down the line that there might be um, notification requirements here or self-reporting um, as, as is on the slide at the bottom, you know, the, the encouraging self-reporting because you want company protection, um, that will then change your steps in your action plan because you will not have the, the goal of confidentiality of, of it not becoming public. Um, oftentimes people act very quickly in a crisis. So again, emphasizing the slow down and, and, and if you, if you take action without thinking about who you need to notify and the types of things that you need to do, you're, you're going to be sitting flat footed. Um, and you don't want to be sitting flat footed, for example, when it is time to exit a senior level executive and you don't have talking points for their uh, direct reports, or you don't have talking points for the third party vendors that they interface with a lot. Because one of the things that people who manage crises often know, people ask questions. And as much as we can tell people just don't respond, that's not it, that doesn't make them feel comfortable. So you want people to be able to have varying uh, degrees of information as well as varying degrees of talking points. So as you're looking at, okay, if we have these steps within the action plan, who is going to be notified um, or who may find this information out, you may have seven to, uh, uh, seven to 10 different talking point packages for people and um, propose question and answers. And critical to that is keeping the board informed. You have to determine materiality um, at the outset, but typically if it's a crisis and it involves a malicious insider and you have um, such that we're at the level that we're talking about, at some point, the board is going to likely be informed. Um, and it's very important that the person who is presenting to the board, whether it be a C-level executive or the general counsel, that they feel um, ready to answer the board's questions. Um, so part of the action plan will include uh, the presentation to the board as well as the proposed question and answers so that the board not only feels confidence in the management of the crisis, but that the person presenting on behalf of the crisis management team, the, the response team, feels confident going in to address and discuss in front of the board. Um, so that's one set of talking points that you're almost always drafting. Um, but part of the action plan is determining when the board notification happens and when you are armed with enough information and data to present to the board, while also balancing the fact that the board needs to be notified early. So as you can see, as we're talking through these all these moving pieces, these are all things that the goal would be to figure out within that first 48 to 72 hours of the crises and making sure you're working through these plans so that you know what steps you need to take at the initial outset. Who do you need to interview? What documents do you need to collect? So that you can advise on the board presentation that might need to take place one week after notice or two weeks. It, it will change depending on the level of the crises, the um, extent of the wrongdoing, and how quickly you need to move to exit the malicious insider or insiders. Um, I often get asked, well, how quick do you need to move? That is going to depend almost entirely on what the alleged wrongdoing is. Um, you do not want to destabilize an organization or a department when the wrongdoing is pretty contained and you can prevent it even with the person in place. That said, you don't want someone walking around continuing to sexually harass um, employees or you think that that could be happening. And so you want to act much quicker in, in certain scenarios. And I'm using sexual harassment as, as, one, as one example. You don't want to exacerbate it and continue it. But um, that will be a discussion. Again, it's why it's so important to identify the key stakeholders. Um, I have probably gone far afield of, of my time and everything. A critical also remember document preservation. Having external counsel helps you 
um, determine privilege or, or helps you pr uh, protect privilege and also making sure you consider whether you want it to be an investigation team versus a litigation team. Um, and, and those are critical things to think about and outside counsel can help you um, work through. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll note before I turn to, to Kate Beatty, who is gonna talk about vendors, which can also, um, which also dovetails nicely with Malicious Insider, is that um, you want to be sure that um, you, you identify the triage points or your inflection points as you work to triage the plan. So you're prioritizing things, but there will be inflection points where you might have to um, change your action plan because new information comes to light. And so it's very critically important that with malicious insider crises, the, in these in particular, that you're, you're able to pivot quickly and um, make those priority calls, again, based on that outset, as Dan talked about, identifying your goals. Um, with that, I'll turn it to Kate. Kate, I know you're going to address vendor wrongdoing. Yes. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Maureen. Hi, everyone. So vendor wrongdoing is, as N Maureen noted, there's going to be a lot of overlap with malicious insider guidance. But with vendor wrongdoing, you have a whole separate set of complications because you don't have total control. This is something has happened with someone that does not work for you. So for, for many reasons, you need to take a more siloed approach where you're, you have control over the, the people and documents within your organization, whereas the vendor, the other company, the third party company has control over their people, their documents, those, st the strategic considerations and the relevant information may overlap to a certain degree, but oftentimes is quite disparate depending on the nature of the issue um, between your company and the vendor. So examples, again, similar to the examples that Maureen gave, fraud or theft from the company. Oftentimes we see issues when there is a rogue independent contractor and it might be an independent contractor to your organization, but that individual is often an employee of a vendor. So a staffing agency, a temp agency, a managed services contract where you have employees of another company either on site at, with your workplace and your workers or interacting regularly, whether it be virtual or in person with your employees issues of labor violations, whether it be immigration related or wage and hour issues. Also, we're potentially in the risk area of joint employment, depending on how you address, particularly if it's a, a vendor employee who has violated one of your policies or harmed one of your employees or your property. You've got to be careful again about taking that siloed approach, slowing down, figuring out how you're going to run it up your flagpole and then separately how it's going to be run up the flagpole of the vendor. Potentially international law violations, like Maureen said, Foreign um, Corrupt Practices Act issues or uh, False Claims Act issues could be at issue. You could have a vendor employee potentially being a whistleblower or potentially implicating a, a, a false claims act issue. And then your standard workplace discrimination harassment issues, because if a vendor's employee is working with your employees, that person could engage in conduct that your employees find offensive. And we can't just say to our employees, well, they don't work for us, so we're not gonna deal with it. Just don't work with them. You have to make sure you address it fully as if you would with your own employees, but again, with this more siloed, separate approach. Dan, sounds like you have a question. <laughs> no, I was gonna ask, what's the first step there? So if the first step after identifying these concerns, and then I see on the slide, it looks like you're gonna address that right now. 
Yeah. So again, our first step is, is slow down, take a deep breath. And I often tell clients, what does the contract say? Because in most instances, you, as opposed to an internal crisis, with an external vendor issue, you're going to have a contract governing the relationship between the parties. The contract may be a one pager and have nothing helpful in it, but you still want to check it and make sure you understand, are there indemnification provisions? So for example, if a manager of the vendor engages in unlawful conduct towards your employees, that vendor may be on the hook to indemnify your company for the litigation and any damages related to that uh, incident. Same goes with potentially wage and hour issues. If, if someone says I was supposed to be paid as an employee, but this vendor had me classified as a 1099 and you other companies should have known that too, and you were controlling my employment. And so I'm owed wages and PTO there may be indemnification provisions that you want to be aware of, and you may not invoke them right away. Sometimes, again, slowing down the approach is, let's figure out if the vendor's going to play ball here and we don't have to get into a legal fight. Maybe they say, hey, this was our bad, we're going to fix it, and then you don't have to go through the, the more formal process, but you want to know up front what are the respective rights and obligations of the parties with respect to indemnification, termination? Can you terminate? Is it a material breach of the agreement so you can terminate it and stop paying the vendor? Is there a notice and cure provision for certain types of termination uh, incidents or triggers? Are there other alternate dispute resolution procedures or notification procedures that you should be aware of. Again, figuring out, are there reporting obligations, figuring out who needs to know, again, as we talked about with the audiences, your the folks in your organization who deal with this vendor, you wanna get out ahead of it with them and explain, hey, there's been an incident with this vendor, here's our point of contact, internally that we're going to be interacting with the vendor so we don't want you account manager or procurement manager we don't want you directly dealing with your contact of the vendor because we are going legal or um, internal audit or the cfo's organization might be dealing with it so making sure that the the folks who deal with this vendor day to day or occasionally or, or are responsible for the vendor know the the plan of attack in terms of figuring out the who, what, when, where, and why of the situation. Considering is this something that the board or some other stakeholder within the organization needs to be notified, thinking through what's the end game here? Is this an important vendor relationship that you think you can work through it? Are you tired of this vendor relationship and maybe this is something that you could use to help exit the relationship but working backwards from okay we've got this problem but maybe it's not the end of the world and maybe there's a path forward that actually gets us to a place that we might have not minded being at we just didn't have the path there considering the pr risks of a response so depending on the type of issue could there be some potential backlash related to the strategy that you take? Is this vendor a household name? Is there some other sensitive issue, whether it be the underlying issue or problem or the players involved? To preview the our labor strike section later on, are there, is this a unionized vendor? Could there be issues with the, the unions or some other interested parties to think through how do we want to approach this wrongdoing by this vendor and who at the vendor knows and, how, and who's the best person to interface with the representatives for the vendor to address the wrongdoing.
I talked about looping in the vendor relationship manager, establishing a point of contact so that you don't have three different or four different people in the company contacting three or four different people at the vendor. Importantly, you don't want to go and talk to their employees and interview them because of joint employment and other risks. You want to make sure that you are interfacing with the right person at the vendor. And maybe it's that there's no line of communication and that's also something to be aware of and move forward accordingly. But you don't want to be pulling vendor employees into your office to ask them, hey, what happened here? This invoice looks wrong or this system installation didn't go correctly. You want to make sure you're running through the proper channels. When investigating the potential wrongdoers, again, keeping it on your side of the street, and if you need to and can coordinate any type of investigation, depending on whether it was a, kind of a lone wolf at the vendor, making sure that you're running those proper channels, preserving emails, documents, making sure the people that work with this vendor know that they should be keeping everything and not deleting anything, and then considering looping in counsel, figuring out what are your potential litigation options. Do you want to send a cease and desist or some other type of correspondence? Depending on the jurisdiction, you might have prerequisites like here in Massachusetts, if you want to file an unfair competition claim against another company, you have to send a demand letter under chapter 93A. So making sure that you're mapping out your potential litigation options if that's the route that you want to go. Okay, and I'll, I'll wrap up with just hopefully some best practices to avoid or decrease the amount of disruption there is when there's a, a vendor wrongdoing incident, thorough vetting of your vendors, uh, restricting access, making sure that vendor employees have only the access they need, training your managers on what that means that if you have independent contractors working in the building or with company email, that they still understand that these are employees that report to a different employer. Regular audits, we often find that when there's a new employee in a CFO line of reporting, that's when a fresh set of eyes looks at a file and says, hey, this isn't adding up. I can't tell you how often I, I asked a client for the vendor contract and it is a one or two page contract that has no clear language regarding indemnification or other um, protection. So thinking through when you're negotiating these vendor contracts, what would be helpful in case the relationship goes off the rails? And then as Maureen talked about having a strong reporting culture where employees understand that they, how to go about complaining about an issue with regard to a vendor. And also at a baseline, understanding that the company's policies around workplace conduct and code of conduct don't just apply to the workforce itself, but also any vendor employees that you're working with employees should feel safe reporting those issues as well. Okay, I'll, I'm that's gonna turn that's, it that's, back that's to That's Dan. great, Kate, thank you very much for that. And with uh, the next topic is gonna be kind of an incident and an accident. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, what are some of the examples, and you've listed them here, that might draw an agency investigation into the workplace? Uh, thanks, Dan. So good afternoon, everyone. So I really want to talk about the kind of incidents that might draw attention when you have a large accident or something that prompts an OSHA investigation. Those things are like examples are fatal accidents or an incident where somebody is hospitalized or um, there's an amputation or something like that, or it could be a major fire or explosion at the plant, or let's say, or an oil spill. Uh, largely the incident, I mean, there are various types of incidents that could result in the kind of publicity that we talk about. Uh, that would create this investigation scenario. Um, a lot of what you've heard already from uh, Maureen and Kate 
uh, also apply in this kind of situation. Um, you know, general things like like don't panic, um, take having an action plan, um, keeping in mind who your audience is. Th these are the same considerations that um, that really um, come into play here as well. Um, but the main difference between an accident investigation and some of those other things that you've heard about here already is that this is an immediate situation and a lot takes on a, a much more urgent scenario. Um, I, I was involved with a situation where there was a fatality explosion at, a, at one of our client's plants uh, a few years ago. And uh, when does this happen? As you might expect, it's on the Friday before Labor Day weekend. Um, what it, who, what do, you, what do you have to do? Uh, scramble to get uh, a team assembled to have your um, your your coordinated response team. Um, you know to to bring in people from out of town sometimes uh, and get to the site where uh, where the incident happened. Um, so the like I said, the main difference between an inspection, uh, an agency inspection like an OSHA investigation that's that's resulting from a major incident. Um, it requires some advanced planning. And I would say that's the number one thing. If there's any takeaway that you, you get from this call, it's it's kind of like a fire drill in a sense that you hope it never happens, but you have to plan because if it does, you can't be putting this together at the last minute. You can't assemble a team the day of Labor Day, for instance, and expect that um, you're gonna be able to deal with the public relations. You're gonna be able to deal with the union you're gonna be able to deal with the agency that's investigating. Um, you're gonna be dealing with your employees and potentially benefit information. If you have fatalities, you have to plan funerals and um, and coordinate benefits for families. I mean, these are real world things that, that all have to come together. So the best advice that we would have, I guess, is on the front end is that companies have this plan in place ahead of time. Who's gonna be responsible if there is a fatality at a plant? Um, how is it, how are we going to deal with this? What is our, how is our health and safety team and the rest of our uh, HR team, how are they going to coordinate uh, the, re the response effort? Understanding that there may be differences all the time, depending on what the incident is, but having a good center plan uh, in order to deal with that is, is well advised. All right. Um, one, one thing I did want to say before I move on is uh, the same things that you heard Maureen talk about um, privilege, um, don't making admissions. Um, those things all again apply. Um, in this particular context, um, the privilege issue arises sometimes in the context of subsequent remedial measures. Um, and you know, you, you're dealing with a situation where maybe you had um, um, an accident in a, in a facility um, and you wanna take steps to make sure that accident doesn't occur again. And so, you might, your health and safety team, they're gonna run out there and they're gonna have a report of the incident. They're gonna have best practices so it doesn't happen again. They're gonna have um, recommendations for maybe a changing of um, putting in barriers or putting in some kind of re subsequent remedial measure. Well, that could come back to bite you in a litigation context. And so we have to be really careful about the kinds of things that we're saying with respect to the incident um, from a liability perspective, because not only do you have to deal with the the concern about, well, what happens on day one of the incident, you're gonna also have to deal with the likely litigation that, that comes from, from it down the road. And so that's why uh, making sure that legal counsel and your team and outside counsel in some cases um, are considering issues of privilege and, um, and those, those aspects uh, when it comes to also reporting, how we're gonna report that to uh, federal and state agencies. Um, those are all considerations as well. All right, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I did wanna mention um, a few points because whenever you have a fatality or you have um, an incident that triggers an OSHA investigation, um, you're gonna have an inspection from OSHA. And when that team comes down, I know this audience may not necessarily be the, the people that are handling the day-to-day -day contact with uh, the investigation agency, but I think we have to be as counsel and, and as those people who are making the decisions, we have to make sure that the people on the ground understand how you have to deal with the agency. Um, and, and that is, you know, some just some general rules 
or guidance that we, we would have is when, when they come on site, it's okay to make them wait, um, make sure that we are, we're directing the investigation, not OSHA in, invest, directing the investigation. And we are kind of making sure that their access to information is something that we determine as best we can um, so that we can try to um, restrict the investigation somewhat in order to, to, to really focus on what the, the purpose of the investigation is and, and make sure that it stays within the scope. Um, there may be questions about whether the agency has a warrant or no warrant to come on site. Um, our, our, my, my thought, and Dan may have other thoughts on that, this is we always wanna be cooperative with the agencies. Um, and I think you get a better outcome when you're cooperative with OSHA or a state investigator um, by allowing them to come in and make sure they feel that you're not trying to hide anything and, and we're being upfront as best we can. Um, I guess it, you know the, the the kind of inspection that you're de typically dealing with and in, with an accident is limiting the area that's related to the uh, the, the accident, right? Um, you're not going to have them come in and inspect all of your. Uh, they will inspect your your 300 logs and other um, certain other documentation, but I think you know the, the more you can put a lid on what they're inspecting, that's that's probably advisable. Um, Again, sorry for jumping through the slides so quickly, and, and I'll, I'll make sure that you guys have these slides after if you have any follow-up questions. But um, the opening conference is really important. Um, the people that are there, having safety, HR, operations folks in that conference is very important um, so that we understand what OSHA is going to be looking at um, and what information we're going to be providing to them pursuant to any ask they have. Um, I like to encourage clients to have their own parallel inspection. So if they're, if they're taking pictures, we should be taking pictures, making sure that we're, um, we understand what information OSHA is asking for and keep a, a separate copy of that. Make sure we give, we make a copy of everything that we're given to the agency. Um, so I'm gonna wrap it up here with, um, with one last slide. And that is, um, you know, OSHA will typically ask to speak to employees and management. Uh, for non-management employees, but I think most of you may know um, that um, you have the right to have management present. Um, right, that um, we would explain to employees before they talk to the investigator about what, why they're being um, interviewed. Uh, for management employees, um, we would, um, you know, we would tell our managers like, don't sign any statements, don't give any notes. We like to be present for those. Um, for those interviews as well, um, and then keep notes. So um, again, before I close off, I think, um, and, there, and there will be a closing conference, I'm not gonna necessarily spend time on that. Um, I, the only point I would make with respect to, to this again is uh, with respect to an agent, uh, an accident or an investigation by OSHA, we have to have our ducks lined up in advance uh, before you have an incident. And th that's the best time to make sure that you're gonna limit liability from a litigation perspective, but you're also going to uh, make sure that we're focused on the employees and, and making sure the morale and other things that, that um, the others talked about earlier are also in play here. So thank you. And Dan, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're going to go on to strikes and we're going to talk quickly because we're running out of time. But I think it's important that we hear from Kate Beatty about what happens when a strike comes. Do we need a plan in place for dealing with a strike. And Kate, I'll turn that over to you. Thanks, Dan. So the short answer is yes, you need a plan. And even better than a plan when it happens is a plan before in case, it, you know, it, the situation happens. And you may be saying, I don't have unionized employees. I'm not a union employer. So why does this matter to me? It matters to all companies on several levels. One, the National Labor Relations Act applies to all employees. And that gives, it's a federal law that gives employees the right to self-organize, to engage in concerted activities for the purpose of mutual aid or protection. So in addition to the more traditional labor components that you think of, like forming a union, going out on strike. It also includes and encompasses 
conduct of employees that don't aren't represented by a union. So for example, if they are banding together to talk about wages at a company, to make demands of the employer related to wages or hours or really any term or condition of employment, then, or if they're supporting employees of a vendor, for example, that are on strike, then that could be seen as protected conduct under the National Labor Relations Act. So in addition to the potential issues you may have with a disruption of service if a vendor was on strike, you may also have issues with employees refusing to cross a picket line or showing support on social media of, of a related business partner that is dealing with a strike. In addition to the more traditional situations where you have a unionized workforce and they go on strike. So Kate, I understand that there are generally two forms of strikes that might occur. Can you talk briefly about both of those? Sure. Under the National Labor Relations Act, and by the way, the National Labor Relations Board gods are probably about to strike me down to try to cover this topic in 10 minutes, um, but I think these are helpful concepts for employers to be aware of. So when we talk about labor strikes in the traditional setting of there's a collective bargaining agreement or a project labor agreement in place, and there's a union or unions representing a certain subset of workers, an economic strike is a strike when, just as it sounds, the employees are striking to get better wages or better hours or other conditions. And this is a situation where strikers can be replaced but not discharged. So they can't be fired. It's considered a quote unquote lawful strike to be on an economic strike. Now, oftentimes these don't happen during the life of a collective bargaining agreement because there are no strike clauses. So it would be a breach of the collective bargaining agreement and an unfair labor practice by the union to let their folks strike. So these are, it's pretty rare for an economic strike to catch an employer by surprise. It can happen when the, when the contract is open and they're at the table bargaining. So for the, for the unionized employer, an economic strike likely not going to come as a surprise, but if you work have a vendor that has unionized employees or you share building space with unionized employees, then not that you're gonna be getting daily updates about collective bargaining negotiations, but it's not a it's not a bad thing to ask, hey, you know, do you have co collective bargaining agreements in place? When are those expiring and keeping general tabs on it in case it would impact your operations? An unfair labor okay. Yeah. Oh. I, you're going to touch on unfair labor practice, strike, right? But I also want you to touch on a secondary boycott. So what a secondary boycott might be after you explain the unfair labor practice, Chuck, that would be very helpful as well. Sure, sure. Yep. Um, so an unfair, unfair labor practice strike is when the union alleges that an unfair labor practice has happened. An unfair labor practice is essentially a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. So, for example, alleging that the employer retaliated against employees for their union affiliation or that the uh, that the employer wasn't bargaining in good faith and had pulled things off the table that, the, that had already been put on the table. So in that instance, the strikers cannot be replaced or discharged. They're entitled to reinstatement even if the company has to fight, has to hire temporary replacements. So as opposed to an economic strike where the employer can bring in people and those people can stay, the temporary workers can become permanent workers, a ULP strike essentially has to go back to status quo. And what about that secondary boycott issue that we just mentioned? Yeah, so, and that's an important one for if, if you're not kind of, directly related to the union, but work side by side with unionized employees, the union can technically can only picket the employer with whom it has a dispute. So for example, if uh, here in Boston, the, the hotel workers were recently um, 
on strike and picketing. So they were seen outside the hotels picketing. What's tricky in a situation like that is if one of those hotels has a restaurant that is separate and apart from the hotel management and their workers aren't unionized, that could be an unlawful secondary boycott if that union is forcing individuals to cross the picket line to get into that restaurant to have dinner. So knowing that if 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 there's a strike happening peripheral to your operation and to your workforce, to know that you also have rights there as an organization um, and should loop in counsel to to navigate how you dispute what could be a secondary boycott. Same goes with pamphleting, as we call it, if they're if the union is trying to um, drop pamphlets or other or have sandwich boards or the trucks that go by a, a property saying, you know, or the big inflatable rat. So this all can impact your business, even if it is not your workforce that's unionized. And then do you have a general key point plan for uh, the strikers or for employers that are confronted with this? Yes, and it's similar to what we've talked about with the other crises where you want to have a dedicated team that's in charge of responding and flowing information down through the company to interested parties, having usually it'll be your labor relations manager or labor counsel your HR, legal, ops, those folks will meet regularly, stay in communication. Hopefully, you'll have already had some kind of response plan in place. Uh, communication strategy, both internal and external, all of your plan B, plan C, plan D for how you're going to keep the operations running and explain to your third-party stakeholders how this strike is not going to impact the services or the products that you provide. And I'll just note that outside the traditional labor strike context, there also can be work stoppages and or threatened work stoppages in a non-union workplace. And those can also, as I said at the outset, implicate NLRA protections because if employees band together and decide to walk out of an employer because they're mad about something, even if they're not represented by a union, they could assert rights under the National Labor Relations Act. So you want to be careful about how you address a situation like that and consult counsel to make sure that you're not running afoul of the NLRA requirements. And that's a perfect transition for the next one. We're going to whip through these last three slides as we close up this uh, webinar for you, because politically charged speech often can be something that union or non-union employees band together to try and make a statement about, right? We saw a lot of that with George Floyd uh, during the summer of discontent, which was 2020. Uh, we're seeing that a lot now with what's going on in the Middle East. Employees can do or say something in a politically charged environment. And the National Labor Relations Act may suggest that there is coverage there, or at least the board will certainly suggest that there is coverage there for taking an adverse action. The key here is to remember that so long as you are a private employer, there is no such thing as freedom of speech in the workplace. But be aware of your National Labor Relations Act protections and also be aware that whatever actions you take adverse to somebody who's engaged in politically motivating or charged speech may get thrown up on a website. So always think about what it is you're doing and do you want everybody in the world to know how you're reacting to that. Best practice, be consistent. Be consistent in all applications and be tempered. Think before act. No knee-jerk reactions in this environment. Next, religious. Um, we have seen this Supreme Court make a significant turn in the last year with Goff v. DeJoy as it comes to religious practices and the respect that employees are required to receive uh, as it relates to their religious practices. 
employers now must make a reasonable accommodation for an employee's religious beliefs or practices. They're not allowed to put religion on a sideboard. It is treated very similarly to the ADA and the interactive process associated with ensuring that a person with a disability gets a, a, a fair shake. Um, best practice here, remember that many people have differing religious opinions. Doesn't mean that it has to be out loud in the workplace. If it's creating a disruption, you can control that, but you should always do it in a respectful manner and do not need uh, to be intolerant of person's religions and also be tolerant of working through the issue, right? You do not want to create a hostile work environment yourself. And finally, I'm going to close with the high profile discrimination charge or claim. This is the charge or the claim where you have a C-suite involved um, and that uh, that there might be a charge filed against the uh, CEO, the CFO, the COO. Uh, you want to give due consideration, especially when it involves a higher C-suite individual, to a third-party independent investigation. There is a defense to companies with discrimination and harassment claims, and it was set up originally by the Supreme Court with two decisions, Fairher and Ellerth. But in order to take advantage of that defense, you have to conduct an investigation. Sometimes it's best to conduct that investigation by a third party so it doesn't look like you've already achieved the end conclusion of the investigation before it's commenced. I would also counsel and advise you that when you're setting up that third party, set it up through an attorney. That way, the initial investigation and the processes can be privileged from discovery. Uh, but at the end of the day, just be aware that that investigation is likely to become public or at least shared. Finally, DEI is still legal. Uh, we've had a ton of reactivity following Joy, uh, George Floyd and his murder to companies implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Then, in the more recent years, we've had pushback on those DEI programs by various uh, conservative organizations who have filed letters of complaint with the EEOC or lawsuits challenging a DEI program because it was actually a benefit to be a person of color or a minority. So my word of advice here and best practice is if your DEI program was legal previous to last summer when the uh, Supreme Court decision in SFFA came out, it is legal today. DEI is still permissible. What you cannot do is make a decision for any benefit or any opportunity in your DEI program that is premised upon or based on race, religion, national origin, gender, et cetera. Uh, we thank you very much for attending this webinar. Take care.